Okay, let's answer some questions from Sunday's Market Outlook. I've seen a few of them. Some of them um, I don't know the answer to, so I'll just say it bluntly, I don't know. Uh, after reading a 10K, I always have the same feeling. This company is so good. How do you avoid this bias? <clears throat> um, yeah, management will very rarely write up a 10K or a 10Q that says we did horrible, unless it's so obvious. <clears throat> uh, oftentimes, it's, you know, we achieved this, we did that, we achieved this, we're well underway on, on this plan. Um, <clears throat> You just have to, uh, you know, sometimes I, I get the same thing. I'll be reading something. I'll think, you know, this is this is pretty optimistic. This is pretty promising. You take a couple of days. You reflect on it. You put the stock on your uh, ticker. You see how it responds to the market. You start thinking about it a little bit more. Let your, let your mind work on it. Whenever you have a problem, it's important to put the problem in your head and then just go away. Your mind will work on it on your own without you exerting effort on it. Uh, but never, the way I would say this, just never act in the moment when you're reading something saying, I got to buy this now. Never act in the moment. Uh, and uh, that should help. If you can <clears throat> sort of start thinking about the drivers of revenue, uh, that's where everything starts. If you don't have revenue, you have nothing else. If you have revenue, you can solve a lot of problems. What are the two or three big drivers of revenue? <clears throat> and um, are they there? Never mind what management says. Uh, service. Credit service companies perform well during rate cuts and slowdowns or recessions. I've never looked at a credit service company, so I can't, uh, I can't answer that. The state of decay the same way during weekends and holidays during uh, weekdays. Yep, T is T. T is time. And uh, T declines by uh, one every single day. By the time you get to Friday morning around 11 to 12, the theta for the weekend, the time value for the weekend comes out and starts coming out. Uh, so um, usually by, by Friday, mid-afternoon Friday, uh, it's already pricing for Monday. Now, have you noticed the app sometimes makes all content disappear? Well, I don't use the app, so no, I can't speak to uh, what the app does. Selling 30 Delta calls on Triple Q for income. <clears throat> Beginning of July, I hit my stop, covered by buying Q outright around 500. Fast forward, my long position went way against me by rolling down my options positions as well, increased and relatively flat on the whole trade. Well, that's how it's done. Good. <clears throat> um... Yeah, any videos on risk management for options? <laughs> Lots. I actually do have the applied series when scrolling through the titles trying to find a video on risk management. Risk management is within every video. Uh, every time I present a strategy, there's, there's risk management within the video. Uh, to do a global risk management video, <clears throat> hard to do that without some context of what risk you're managing. Uh, so if you, you know, just... Uh, have a bit of process and you say well let me go through this video then I'll go through the next as you go through each one uh, you'll find the risk management for each strategy within the video itself one of your videos on options implied series you mentioned that higher interest rates drive up the price of calls yes they do higher interest rates restrict company growth we haven't seen that too much higher interest rates would lead to a higher uh, cap M <clears throat> mm, well, you're missing something, right? Uh, if you're thinking about uh, cap M, you have the risk free rate plus you have a beta times the equity risk premium. Uh, this is typically a long bond, uh, the 20 year or the 30 year. Uh, <clears throat> and as uh, rates go up, the equity premium does shrink. This is the premium for being in equities above being in bonds. Uh, that if the market does not drop in price and just maintains its price or even goes higher, the equity risk premium shrinks. So even though you have this going up, you have this going down. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so uh, there is there is there are the two two forces there. Uh, thus, increasing the denominator discount of cash flow model to reduce the valuation of a company. Typically, typically you could say yes. From this standpoint, I would think that higher interest rates reduce share prices. You would think. 
obviously leading to lower prices for call options. Do you, you know, can you talk a little bit about why higher interest rates increase the price of call options as opposed to decreasing their prices? <clears throat> um, the, uh, the formula for Black Scholes Merton includes within it uh, a continuously compounded risk free rate. Um, it does not make decisions, uh, it, it doesn't do second order thinking. So the model doesn't say, but wait a minute, if this goes higher, then this is, will most likely happen, and this will happen, and uh, yeah, that doesn't work that way. If you have a stock price uh, and you have a low interest rate, there's the forward curve, and options, the, del the 0.5 delta will be priced on the forward curve, higher interest rate, higher interest rate. So the 0.5 delta keeps increasing, uh, the higher the interest rate. <clears throat> Regardless of what you think is going to happen, the call is simply priced as a function of its input variables, which are mostly objective except for volatility, right? Uh, for that, we have to imply it because that is driven by supply and demand uh, for the option, the buying and selling pressure. <clears throat> but very little, very little other than that, there's no subjectivity in those variables. There's no second order thinking saying, well, if this is higher, then this will be this, then this will be that. So we see the stock price because the stock price is an input. It should be lower, right? So let me use uh, the lower stock price in, in the model. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. Now, this sets up an opportunity, right? <clears throat> if you believe what you just said, that the stock price should be lower, Shouldn't the call price be lower? You would think, well, the fair value of the call should be lower. Well, then sell the call. Because in your mind, according to your logic, the calls are overpriced, right? Uh, how to for extracting SEC data <clears throat> into Excel for the applied series. So what you do is you, you find your company on Edgar. Uh, you find uh, it has a, if you look on the right panel, you'll see all the 10Ks. You'll or, or you'll see a 10K and then don't click on the link for 10K right beside it You'll see the a little box that says filing click on that and look for interactive data uh, Once you have the interactive data up above the menu where the menu is on the left side of your screen above the menu It will say uh, download uh, in Excel It doesn't look pretty in Excel. Let me see if I can show you what it looks like uh, in Excel uh, I'll bring this onto the screen here. <clears throat> I've downloaded one uh, uh, for you to see what it looks like. And uh, if you see all along the bottom, uh, here is everything. There's your cover sheet. And there's your audit information. There's your income statement. Notice you've got uh, three years here. There's your consolidated statement of income. There's your balance sheet, consolidated balance sheet, statement of equity. And if you scroll along the bottom, you'll see you have everything down here. Investment, fair value measurement, debt, leases, stockholders' equity, stock-based compensation plans, income taxes, net income per common. So <clears throat> it's, uh, it's um, the process that I just described, but in the, uh, in the video for um, financial modeling, I'll show you how to do that. <clears throat> I personally don't, don't do that. It's not that difficult to just look at the screen and... Uh, uh, key numbers in. Um, I, I I just I find it better when I'm I'm actually keying in the number myself as opposed to taking the number that's given because I get a feel for the numbers and the feel for the accounts. Plus, um, you're not going to need all those accounts. You're going to collapse quite a few of those accounts into just a broad category called other because some of them <clears throat> are non-forecastable and some of them are immaterial in your forecasting. Some you'll just be in no position to know what like fair value of changes in, in, in uh, marketable securities. Uh, you, you, you'll be in no position to know what that is because you're not going to know what they're holding. Uh, they may give you some sensitivity analysis and you may have some forecast of interest rates, but for the most part, it's not a driver of revenue. So it's, it's, it's really low on the list of things we care about. <clears throat> um... While inputting information into the Motorin's Excel valuation model for a company, I was having difficulty figuring out the number of outstanding employee options to insert in the model using the company's 10K. Uh, given your expertise and amount of experience evaluating companies, I'm sure it is very rare for you to come across something in a 10K that makes you scratch your head, <clears throat> but was curious about how you... Well, that's not true. There are some things I come across and I look and I think, uh, <clears throat> I can't make sense of this. 
uh, or, or it's presented in such a way that, that there's no way that I can answer it without more questions. And that might be by design. So a company has to, has to present a certain amount of information, but they certainly don't have to tell you everything. So if there's something that they'd rather not tell you everything on, uh, it's usually presented in a way that it's never going to answer all your questions. Um, but, but we can use history as a guide sometimes. <clears throat> Some companies have a fairly constant or near constant uh, stock, uh, stock plan award system in place. Um, but usually we can, we can come to figure it out. And if we can't, we can just use like sort of an average because it's, <clears throat> unless it's big stock awards, six, 7% of the outstanding shares each year, unless it's big, it's not really going to be that material. It's not a driver, uh, for earnings. Some companies just with the amount of stock options, uh, it becomes, it becomes significant for the difference between diluted uh, and basic. Most companies, eh, there's something, you don't have to forecast every line item. <clears throat> Assuming an expectation of hot CPI this week, we did get CPI. It was, eh, eh, the market seems to be, well, okay. It's slightly green. It's not, it's not going way up. It's not going way down. It's just saying, okay, well, then I guess retail sales is what we'll look out for. <clears throat> what strategies would effectively hedge downside risk? Would you focus on hedging against a broader market or target individual positions? Uh, hedging on the way down is always better to do at the market level. Uh, but <clears throat> I, I don't know that we, we have that going on today. Uh, a hedge is done before the fact. After the fact. Like Think about buying insurance <clears throat> for damage on your house. That's a hedge against downside risk to your house. You don't wait till your house is damaged and then go get insurance, right? You have to have it in place before it happens. <clears throat> Owen Sinclair's Volatility Trading Book. I haven't read it. Do you think there's anything practical in there that still applies today that we can't already get from your applied series? No, I haven't read it, so I can't make a comment on that. Uh, any other must-read books on options? Uh, Sheldonberg, Nathan Sheldonberg, probably the Bible on options. How do you know if your maintenance margin is low enough relative to, the, to net liquidity? Um, <clears throat> in your um, account information, uh, second tab is margin requirements. You, you, you should be nowhere near uh, 10%. Like once you start getting to 10%, IB starts printing that yellow and telling you, Hey, look, you should be paying attention to this in a fast moving market that could cause you difficulty very quick. <clears throat> you should never allow yourself to get to that point. And once you do get to 10%, that's when you should start making your own decisions as opposed to the market forcing you to make decisions. Over the last few days, I've had daily theta at 0.2% of my portfolio. My excess liquidity swim from 50% to 25%, despite my net liquidity only going down about 5 makes me worried I get a margin call, even if it seems I'd be okay one day. Yeah, that's, you just don't want to get near the, near the line. Playing near the line, uh, you're going to get hurt because you're never just going to play near the line and be perfectly fine. <clears throat> if, if, for anyone out there, if you uh, play at the edge of your margin, you're going to lose money because you you would have to have everything work out in your favor all the time if you're going to play at the edge of your margin. Uh, that's never going to happen. <clears throat> and when you're at the edge of your margin in a loss position, you have you then have to take those losses. Uh, so now you have an, an absolute lower portfolio value uh, that you need Huge, you need bigger and bigger upsides to the market just to break even because you don't have the same number of shares that would appreciate because you've been forced to take your loss. <clears throat> um, I think borrowing to invest only makes sense at very low interest rates, like very low interest rates and a bull market where everything is fine, everything is great, uh, and, and uh, you know, interest rates are low. <clears throat> then, then, okay, go ahead and use use uh, some of your broker's money but right now super expensive uh, to use your broker's money and um, given that interest rates are high you also run the risk of heightened volatility whenever the market gets scared 
<clears throat> Oxy also said on the call they wanted to to butt all the crown buy all of crown okay buy all of crown rock but have a partnership with uh eco petrol not anymore that let them participate in the deal however the president won't allow them so it seems like good outcome for oxy <clears throat> uh well a good outcome except it's going to cost more um there the um target company is issuing shares um oxy did take a hit on that not much they did take a hit i'm sure they'll digest it they've got the cash flows to figure it out it's not the deal they originally thought they had but <clears throat> either way I, I don't see it as uh as you know uh, a killer to to my investment theme for oxy just uh oh well you know too bad but uh <clears throat> They got a good management team that can roll with the punches, and that's the important thing. Can they adapt to a changing uh, situation? And if they can, okay. Could you share trades you made on last Monday, especially those involving volatility? What kind of puts did you sell? Uh, I sold out of the money. Uh, days to expiration, long, 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 longer dated. Which Greek do you consider most other than Vega? <clears throat> uh, theta. Can you share your thoughts on the kind of options you would sell under market volatility spike? I don't know. I I mean, <clears throat> I, I I just don't know. Uh, it's sometimes it's what the market lets you sell. Uh, other times it's where you get the best the best return. Um, sometimes it's positioning yourself for saying, well, listen, what if I'm wrong? You know, uh, I'm, would I be okay with this outcome? Um, I don't know. <clears throat> uh, I, I know that I would be doing it. I have a target list that, that I'm interested in. You know, GM, FCX, uh, Oxy, On Semi. Uh, they're consistently on that list. <clears throat> uh, SPY is always a good one to sell, uh, to sell on because it is a diversified portfolio of 500 stocks. So you're eliminating idiosyncratic risk and you're just taking market risk. Uh, but honestly, uh, let's say that the market sold off hard into Friday. What would I sell puts on? From where I stand today, I don't know. I know I know where I what things I'd look at, but I don't know if I'd actually do anything on those things. So at this point, I would say I, I can't give you exact names and exact strike prices and the price I'd be selling. I don't know. It it will be what the market gives me, right? So the market could sell off hard. But copper prices could spike because of something. Freeport could spike because of that. And well, I'm not selling puts on that because there won't be any premium on there because it's 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 going against the entire market. So, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I'll only know it when I see it. Uh, and because of that, it's important to build your watch list carefully. So you may have a watch list <clears throat> of, of uh, you know, stocks that you like or issues that you like, or issues that you say, only when volatility is really high do I like this one, and only if the price really drops. And, you know, you're going to look at skew, you're going to see how elevated skew is. And then you make decisions, you know, issue by issue. You can say, mm, eh, this is not the same as, uh, you know, I, I, I'd like to see it, I'd like to see this, I'd like to see that, or the premiums are not showing up here, this one's not coming along, this one's really overreacting. Excellent. I'll only know when I see it. Every every sell-off has the same pattern at the macro level, but at the micro level, it's like a pot of boiling water. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on. You can tell the pot of water is boiling, but you don't know where the next air bubble will leave the bottom of the pot. Right? So, I don't know. Would you say the Cleveland Fed's inflation now casting is the most accurate forecasting tool for inflation? I don't know because I don't know about other forecasting tools. So I would say it is a forecasting tool. Is it accurate? I don't know. Is it the most accurate? That I don't know. Are there other reputable sources? Um, public? Probably not. Proprietary? Probably. Would you say the most accurate forecasting tool of inflation is Cleveland Fed? Oh, <clears throat> that's the same question repeated another way. Tell me if I'm wrong. But you're still paying for shorting the USD and going long the peso, although this is offset by the Tesla short. Uh, I'm not paying for it, right? I'm not paying for it. So let's say that I had 
a thousand dollars and I wanted to do something and uh, I sold something I didn't own and I got a hundred dollars for it and I used that hundred dollars to do something else uh, that's other people's money right it's a carry trade using other people's money I still have my thousand dollars so in essence I'm not really paying for it unless you mean but you didn't have to do this right once you uh, generate a hundred dollars by selling something you don't own you easily could have earned a rate on that sure I could have earned that by going into a t-bill or I could have earned something on that by going into something else I went into something else but in the end it's really not my money it's other people's money right so uh, I find something to short it generates some income and as long as I keep that in in some kind of liquid uh, cash it doesn't have to be like I can sell short something in US dollars and as long as I have some other currency uh, it will act as margin all all the broker cares about is you have the collateral to back up what you just did uh, and different assets have different collateral values so equities might only be worth half the collateral the t-bill would be worth all the collateral so a t-bill would be acceptable as your full collateral against your short position so as long as you take the proceeds of your short sale and you put it into something that is collateralized or, or that will collateralize that loan, you're perfectly fine. So in a pure sense, you could say opportunity cost. You are paying for it. But if I, was, if I wasn't going to go into this, I probably wouldn't have looked for this, right? So you're not wrong, uh, but you're just thinking about it differently. You're thinking about it in, in the sense that it was your money, so it's your opportunity cost, but it wasn't my money. <clears throat> without the position you would benefit from the US gain through Tesla short true but but would I have would I have done it eh, you know what probably I probably would have done it anyways um, but so the the only question here is because I am uh, uh, because I'm giving up as you say the t-bill rate to get into something else there's my benchmark against this investment right every investment has some kind of benchmark can I do better here than I could have done in a T-bill? And if I can, well, then I've generated alpha. Curious, if on Wednesday morning you have a pot, the market will drop 20% in the next two weeks. <clears throat> I, don't think, uh, I don't think this is, we're going to do it un unless sentiment changes when the market opens. Do you have enough cash to cover all your short puts? I do. What kind of risk management do you implement in that situation? Uh, <clears throat> uh I, I am not capacity constrained uh, with uh, short-term interest rates where they are 5.5% uh, for, for doing nothing. I don't even have to get out of bed and I get 5.5%. I'll take it. If you had low interest rates, we go back to 0.2 on, on the uh, T-bill rate. Well, then there's nothing there. That's boring. I mean, there's nothing there. Then you would be more fully invested then you'd be more concerned about downturns, but at 2%, downturns would be minimal because where are you going to go? Bonds, right? Right now, bonds are a real alternative. T-bills are a real alternative. Money market funds are a real alternative. Corporates are a real alternative. Even corporate money market funds uh, are a real alternative. Commercial paper, bankers' acceptance, a real alternative to the volatility of equity but with interest rates really low where you get nothing to be there uh you get a market that's down two percent three percent it's like well i'm, I'm going to buy this dip you call it a dip even though it's only two or three percent because where are you going to go right now there's a lot of places to go so uh yeah i'm less inclined to be fully invested so yes i can afford everything that's that would be put to me and keep in mind, you don't have to take it if it's being put to you, right? So let's say that you have August 16th options that expire. Uh, you can roll them forward to September. So let's say you have $50 puts on something. You can roll them forward uh, to September. You know, stock price is 45 You can roll them over to September. And sometimes you can pick up a premium, maybe another $0.20, $0.30 uh, a pickup. Sometimes, you know, if the stock is at 49 and it's at 50 and you don't want to buy it at 49, you can roll over to September and sometimes down to the 47.50s for, for the same amount of money. In other words, you could do it for free. So you can roll forward and down at the same time. You can continually roll forward your options, usually for a pickup of premium each time you do it, to avoid anything ever being put to you. 
unless, of course, you have the $50 put and the stock's at 35. Now, that's a tough rollover. But if it's at 35, I would have said, how come you didn't step in sooner? How come you didn't roll, uh, or roll them sooner as the stock was falling? Why didn't you roll them? Uh, or why didn't you buy, call, uh, buy puts at the same time that you had sold puts? Why didn't, why didn't you sell in the money call? Why didn't you do something? <clears throat> right? I would have, I uh, you know, if you let it get to that point, well, you know, you, you should have. Each, each day you look, you say, well, I need to do some risk management. And here's the thing that I hear. Uh, you, you got a $50 put and the stock is dropping. It's at 48 you know. And if you were sitting beside me, i say, what are you going to do? This is, this, is, this is the reaction I would hear most often. Well, it might recover. I mean, I'm not going to do anything. It might recover. Oh, hope. Beautiful. That's wonderful. That's a strategy. Hope. No, what are you going to do? Here's the reality of the situation. What are you going to do? Right? Next day, it's 47. What are you going to do? Well, it's a little overdone. It's probably due for a bounce. Ah, hope. Beautiful. Hope is what gets you to $35, right? You got to step in. You got to start thinking about, okay, my initial, my initial strategy is done. I can't keep playing the same strategy when conditions change. I need to change the strategy of my game. Right, so you have to think about uh, uh, what you would do now. You see this uh, oftentimes in in uh, um, sports where a team has got a big lead, right, and they followed a particular strategy to get that lead. And when their lead is big enough, they'll change their strategy. So they may be uh, offense uh, for the first part of the game, and when they see that they've got a a large enough lead, they'll take their stars off. They don't want their stars getting hurt, especially if it's playoff season. And then they'll play with strong defense. Let's just hold our lead. Hold our lead, right? So you also see this in a team that's losing. At the very end, especially in hockey, what do they do to their goalie? They pull their goalie and they put six on the ice versus five, right? And they try to keep the puck at the other end of the, uh, at the, other end of the arena and they just, they just maximize shots on net. Uh, they're going to lose anyway, so may as well pull the goalie. What does it matter if they lose by one goal or lose by two? They're going to lose anyways, right? So you have to be willing to change your strategy as the game changes. If you're in lead position, maybe you change your strategy to be more defensive. If you're in losing position, you got to get more, more offensive and say, well, how do, I, how do I deal with this as it's happening? I can't hope that my team scores a goal. I have to put something in place that gives them the advantage to score the goal. You get that? Where are we on time? I'm doing this before the market opens, so I'm, I'm uh, going to try to do as many as I can, knowing that I can't do them all, and then I'll pick it up. Well, I mean, I don't even have to tell you this, because as you're watching the video, you wouldn't even know that I stopped and started, but there it is. I'll tell you that that's what I'm doing. Uh, high interest rates, you don't like buying calls because they're expensive? True. Instead, you said you'd prefer selling in the money puts? True. Does the opposite hold true as well in terms of low rates or vol? Do you favor buying calls? Yep, yep. Uh, synthetics, uh, re risk reversals, uh, but, but being long calls becomes a very valid part of the strategy. So when I do synthetics now, and I, and I, I do uh, still do synthetics, uh, I will do very short-term synthetics, like one-month synthetic, and then you have to continually roll that synthetic. <clears throat> you have to do that. When interest rates are low, I'll do a one-year synthetic. I'll go out one year and do a synthetic because what I'm trying to do is replicate the stock without owning the stock. And I usually do that when I was in Canada. I did that for U.S. stocks because I did not want the dividend withholding. And if I did this for a U.S. stock, the dividend is in the present value of the options. So it's already in the value of the options. So if I'm buying an at-the-money uh, synthetic or if I'm creating an at-the-money synthetic, it should be a credit uh, for me. I should be getting paid today the present value of that dividend. Uh, and now it's a capital gain. It's not a dividend subject to withholding. I also have no currency risk, right? So I usually do it for those reasons, go one year out. But with high interest rates, uh, you got to get the hurdle rate. I have to earn, the position has to earn the risk-free rate before I even make anything because I'm already paying for the risk-free rate up front. I'm already paying for the interest cost on the loan that, that theoretically is being borrowed to finance the underlying position. Wow, I'm not interested in that.
at all. Uh, the zip, so yeah, so yeah. Once interest rates are are very low, then yeah, I use a lot more calls in my strategies. Thoughts on trading the VIX or volatility on VIX as an alternative ones a CPI. I don't like VIX because it's sentiment driven. <clears throat> uh, there is no no arbitrage pricing for futures and options. There is for futures especially the pricing is a no arbitrage price. It's a it's a function of the interest rate and time and the carrying cost of the underlying. Uh, for options, it's close to a no arbitrage price. You can't really tell because of the implied volatility, but you can you can play the implied volatility distribution versus the historical volatility distribution. There is something there you can play. But with VIX, it's all sentiment driven. Uh, so uh, you can have a forward curve on VIX that looks like this if the VIX is spot VIX is here and you say well I'll buy this futures well the VIX has to rise to that point before you make anything if you buy a call on these futures the call this futures price has to rise to hit the call price which means the VIX has to rise to there before you hit anything the more negative sentiment it is the steeper this curve is the harder it is to actually get anything on VIX or make any significant money on that trade uh, let's see what well, uh, let's assume CPI and inflation risen to four percent with buying a two month out of the money put on SPY a few minutes after the release careful SPY is uh, an ETF right uh, which means that options trading is it going to open at 930 the report comes out at 830 uh, you're not going to get that done a few minutes after you would have to move to MES uh, MES is for 50, <clears throat> equivalent to about 50 SPY. So you would sell two MES uh, um, if you want the two month out of the money. You'd have to do it on MES because these are futures and these will be trading. Um, we'd be better see, sell deep in the money calls since IV will likely skyrocket. When IV skyrockets on the level of the index, uh, if this is uh, implied volatility and these are strike prices, uh, and here is uh, the price of the stock, when, when, when volatility rises, you usually get this going on. It doesn't really do it on the calls on the index. At the stock level, you'll get something like this. You'll get a smile, but it's not the calls that will have the high level of implied volatility. It'll be the puts. If you are not... Uh, Part of the applied level, if you haven't gone through the applied options module, um, you you wouldn't know everything I just described to you. But if you have gone through it, then you you'd you'd know this. And it might be I can see that for you it, it would it would be worth it. How does the Fed make the decision to cut raise rates? Is it majority vote or do they require a consensus? They'd like to get a consensus, but it's a majority. What is the benefit from using SPY versus uh, ES uh, during shorts? ES is a futures contract, which means it costs you nothing to enter. So you pay nothing and you get nothing. It might cost you $2 uh, for the contract uh, exchange fee. Uh, SPY is an ETF. When you short SPY, you get dollars. You get, uh, what is it, $540 per share USD. Now that's restricted cash, mind you. You can't just take that out and do whatever you want. You can put that money somewhere as long as it is what is considered near cash or a cash equivalent. So anything up to probably about a three month T-bill, uh, you can get that done. Uh, so that's the difference. One of them gives you, gives you uh, money on the way in. So let's say you had an account with IB and you had uh, CAD dollars, uh, you have uh, pesos uh, and you have USD, but you have negative uh, amount in USD. You're going to pay paying an interest rate on that. If you short uh, SPY, you'll get 540 a share. It could wipe off the negative balance, so you won't be paying interest on your negative balance. And then you don't actually have to invest the U.S. cash that you get, because if you did, you'd have a negative balance again. <clears throat> it could just be helpful in clearing off a negative balance in your account. <clears throat> hmm. Would uh, low rates affect rental REITs uh, no no because the discount rate would be lower <clears throat> lower lower rates lower cap rates a lower cap rate higher property values so it wouldn't affect it wouldn't affect REITs 
um, not on not on the property value component. <clears throat> if you're making an argument that lower rates might affect apartment rentals because more people would be willing to buy homes, I agree. But in Canada, with the Canadian apartment REITs, buy homes all you want. You can have a desire to buy a home all you want. They don't exist for the number of people who would need to buy a home. So uh, that's, that's the problem, is the alternative uh, at lower interest rates might be appealing if you can get it. It's kind of like Canadian healthcare. It's free if you can get it. That's the big deal. If you can get it, it's free. I can't get it. I never could get it. So I actually never got the free stuff that I was paying for. And you do pay for it because you pay taxes, right? So you're paying for it. It's not really free. Everyone's paying for it. But I never got the free stuff I was paying for. I want you to think about that sentence in your head. I never got the free stuff I was paying for. Yeah. You know, why Why make me pay for it and not give it to me? Why just? Why not just tell everyone, look, go pay for your own health insurance. Now you can get it. Now you can get the stuff you pay for instead of not getting the stuff you pay for. Uh, how do you keep track of your monthly annual ROI per stock strategy portfolio? Uh, per, per stock, it's not the... Uh, IB gives you a, a whole bunch of worksheets. You could do it, but per stock, I don't know that, that it's worth looking at my ROI per stock as opposed to looking at the overall overall effect on the portfolio. Sometimes you you add something to your portfolio, not because it holds out the potential of high ROI, but because it holds out the potential of diversification, uh, even if you know even maybe a negative correlation, which means uh, a not just diversification, but maybe even leaning to a hedge, and and the goal is not a high ROI, but uh, to to uh, lower the risk of the portfolio. So sometimes you do things not because it has ROI, but because it it's part of risk management. So. I don't know about looking at it uh, at that level. <clears throat> uh, I feel IBROI is too too general. I'd like to know where I'm underperforming in my strategies. If you're using Excel, is it available for download? No, I don't. I don't do that. I don't. I, again, I don't. I don't see the the value in doing that. I'm not reporting to anyone. I'm not trying to solicit funds under management <clears throat> so I'm not trying to break down uh, my return you know to show how I did versus a benchmark I have no benchmark so it would be hard for me to do that <clears throat> um, you can still get that done in Excel I mean it gives you every name you've been in so it gives you a sheet and it says okay uh, TLT and it'll tell you you have a column here it's all short term and another one that's long term It'll tell you your short-term gains and losses, your long-term gains and losses, and what's unrealized. Uh, you can figure out what your return, uh, what your return was uh, on that. Uh, I don't know that 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 that's difficult to do. Can you provide your thought process for allocating the utilities portion of your portfolio between XLU and NEE? Well, XLU is a diversified portfolio, so you don't have to pick uh, winners. Uh, NEE is what I think one winner. Uh, but you can't just be all in NEE. You have too much idiosyncratic risk. So NEE, sure, give me another one. right? If I find another utility that I like, I will add that as well. Eventually, I might have four or five utilities and I might not feel the need for XLU. But in, in the absence of having the ability to diversify across four or five utilities myself, I may as well take a diversified portfolio of utilities, which is XLU. <clears throat> so now I've eliminated with that portfolio much of the idiosyncratic risk of each company. And what I have is a factor, which is beta and uh, utilities. Uh, previous video you mentioned that in times of high rates, you don't like buying calls. Oh, I already answered that. Oh, it's, it's just uh, everyone, uh, is that back up here somewhere? Yeah, there it is. Okay, everyone's asking questions twice. All right. <clears throat> you mentioned Theta Decay for the weekend coming out again? Friday by noon. Am I, everyone's asking questions twice? Do you think there's a way of taking advantage of this? Not really. Sell calls, puts Thursday, sell Friday. Eh. You know, once you start thinking it comes out Friday afternoon, people start doing it 
Friday morning. Once you start doing it Friday morning, people start saying, well, let's do it Thursday afternoon. When I say it comes out uh, on the weekends, <clears throat> that's a fair enough, or it comes out on Friday, that's a fair enough assessment. But, you know, if you've got a 45-day option, <clears throat> Two days of theta is not going to, it's not a trading strategy. You know, uh, I, I wouldn't seem to think so. <clears throat> theta, not really. Volatility, sure. Your view on BOG moving yen. It's interesting. Could you share your opinion on a couple of the pros and cons of being a funding currency? Um, <clears throat> well, I, the, the negative is it's going to drive your currency value down. If you're an exporter, that might be a good thing. Depends on what your imports are. If it's a critical thing that you're importing, that's not so good. <clears throat> um, if you can get an interest rate on it uh, and you have a very large carry trade, you're a very large carry and you can get an interest rate on it, you might even be able to nullify the interest rate you're paying on the money market securities in your own country. <clears throat> so it is. it could be a form of income in that sense, or a, an interest expense offset. Uh, but you would still, you know, you'd still, you'd have to have a positive interest rate, but still low. So there's only a limit to how far, how far you can go, but you still have to worry about the currency risk, right? So it's, you know, it's, it's like having a pet lion. It's, it's kind of fun to have a pet lion, but you got a pet lion. And just keep in mind, it's still a lion, right? You ever see those YouTube videos where somebody's playing with their pet lion and suddenly the lion just attacks them? Wow. <laughs> That's what you got. <clears throat> Mentioned bid ask spreads were wide for you to sell puts. If trade conviction is high, would you have sold? Nah, I would have found another way. Um, no. Uh, <clears throat> the, the spreads uh, for the volatility trade were too wide that if you look... Because you have a, a bid and an ask. Let's just uh, clear off the screen here so I can get some real estate to write on. You have a bid and an ask, right? Let's say it's 45 to $95. $45 to $95. That's a big spread. The IV on this might be 73%. The implied volatility on this might be 24% when implied volatility is sitting at 50 Right? So... You can try the middle of the spread to see if you get it, but when you have these wide spreads, it's the market maker saying, we're really not interested in doing a damn thing here. <clears throat> Otherwise, why would you do that? That is the market maker just not wanting to provide liquidity at all. You could go in the middle and see what you get. Uh, so you could uh, go to $70, <clears throat> and if you get picked up at 70 this is the implied volatility you would get, but it's priced out so that if you hit the 45, you're not really selling volatility. Because the IV in there is only 24. So if IV drops from 50 down to 24, this would then close this way and you'd have a 45 to 46 thing. And you wouldn't make anything for volatility dropping. you got to sell the option with the high implied volatility. Crossing the spread it doesn't give you anything. Not, not for something that wide. <clears throat> Over the past decade, stock market has been largely driven by a handful of major companies like Apple, Google. Uh, while well, many value stocks have struggled in this in the coming decades with advancements in technology, especially in AI and the increasing dominance and efficiency of large companies, do you think traditional approach to value investing is advocated by Buffett's becoming outdated? No, I don't. Because <clears throat> these companies and their practices can only get, they can only get so big and their practices so nefarious before politicians step in and say, okay, okay, we got to do something here. Uh, Google is under attack now for its monopoly on search. Uh, other companies are under attack. My, uh, Apple has been under attack for its uh, for its app store and the taking of the 30% of your success. Uh, and that's just a money grab. Uh, I'm hearing uh, more and more about the uh, uh, dislike and the uncomfortableness of personalized pricing where you pay a particular price, but somebody else pays a different price, and yet somebody else pays yet a different price. You have your own price based on what we know about you. You have, a, you know, you're of this age, you have this kind of income. We've seen that you've eaten at this restaurant before, which is fairly high end. You've flown business class before, which is expensive, and now you want to buy something online. Well, you can afford more. So we'll charge you more because we know you got it. 
I'm hearing a lot of pushback uh, on that kind of stuff. That, I think, has a limited life, this personalized pricing. And the size of tech, I mean, it's tech that's doing that. It's tech that's enabling uh, other companies to fleece you down. Because Google will then sell <clears throat> to the online platform that you're on information about you so that the online platform can then give you a price they think you would pay. So somebody else may see $199, you may see $259 because that site thinks, well, you got it. Based on the profile that Google tells me about you, you got the money, you can afford this. That, that, I believe is coming to then weaponizing your data against you, I think is coming to an end. So these companies can only get so big and act so bad before politicians will rip them apart. They've got to be careful about that. Uh, so, <clears throat> no, I don't think that traditional value investing is dead. But I do think uh, that, uh, you know, I said this two, about two years ago, that we are entering an era of large firm capitalism simply because of the power of data <clears throat> until we get some legislation that says, okay, you cannot use data against the customer anymore, which means that most of the data they have could never be used. Uh, uh, to individualize your experience or individualize your pricing. That any data they collect, I can see this coming, would have to be stripped of any marker of who it belongs to. So you can collect data on the population of your users to get big trends, but you must strip the data <clears throat> of any marker of who it belonged to, which means if even if you took one line item from a database, you got no idea whose that is. I think that... That is going to be some, some, some requirement coming in. <clears throat> Question on lean hog uh, live cattle spread trade. Is there a reason why you do not use back adjusted futures data instead of non-adjusted data for entering exiting trades? I imagine back adjusted data might be more useful as it would remove rollover gaps. Uh, <clears throat> Seems, it seems to lose its mean reverting properties. Well, I'll tell you, it, uh, it worked for me. Uh, it hasn't mean reverted in a while, uh, but the, this is the risk of mean reverting trades, is you may get a regime change where the mean reverting level changes. Oil and natural gas uh, used to have a 10 to 1 uh, ratio. Uh, uh, of CL to uh, NG, uh, so that if oil was uh, $70 a barrel, you'd expect natural gas to be uh, $7. Um, that's gone. <clears throat> Gold and silver used to be a 50 to 1. So if you saw um, uh, gold at 1500, you'd expect to see silver at 30. Uh, that's gone. Uh, the spread between hogs and cattle used to be 50 cents on the uh on the contract price for the same month for each each month for the same month it was 50 cents was sort of a mean reverting level uh, well it could be that that's gone so maybe what you're looking at in the last couple of years is not mean reverting it could be gone um these these relationships uh aren't laws <clears throat> And there could be fundamental reasons or fundamental shifts in, in cattle uh, ranching and uh, hog, uh, uh, hog farming that, that, that has changed that relationship. Much like shale oil produced an abundance of natural gas, and that's what uh, killed this. Here it was the yield uh, uh, per ton of ore on gold going straight down while silver maintained. So... Uh, when you have that, it's it's uh, it's going to change the relationship. <clears throat> so there could be some change in relationship. Uh, and as far as how you find relationships, there's never one one way to find relationships. You know, for example, I may just something really simple. Uh, if I use a three-year weekly to get beta, you might say, well, how come you're not using a one-year daily? Somebody else may come along and say, why not a five-year monthly? You know, like, what are you guys doing? Everyone will have their own opinion about what works, right? So, 
Um, by manufacturing a dividend on CompX, you are referring to sell low delta calls on it monthly while holding. Correct. Correct. If you have the underlying and you're selling 10 delta or 15 delta calls, you can double the dividend. You can, or, or if it doesn't pay a dividend, you can manufacture your own dividend. Any reason to not do this with most holdings in the portfolio, especially if the strike of those calls are high enough? <clears throat> yeah, some things I hold have no options, right? Uh, in Canadian apartment REITs, cap REIT has options, <clears throat> but none of the others do. So uh, uh, on cap REIT, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to, to really do that uh, until I see it getting closer to its nav. Once it starts getting closer to its nav, I would then say, well, okay, let's... Well, let's hold this for a period of time. If I feel comfortable, you know, saying uh, uh, that that I can see its nav increasing over time, uh, and let's double the dividend. Sure, I do that a lot. Uh, I do that a lot. You mentioned synesthesia AI a few weeks ago. I tried it out. I'm pretty impressed. It's not perfect, but I can see the use case. <clears throat> I was able to go into Gemini and write pretty good training script and feed that. Quality of voice and manners, but yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it's kind of neat. If 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 you need to find a new speaker uh, in a video series, uh, you can just write a script and give it uh, and give it to this, and it'll read it for you. <clears throat> uh, but I haven't really I haven't really pushed it too far. I'm 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 more in the field right now of or in the space right now of just making a list of what looks interesting and and saying okay well this looks good and that looks good but <clears throat> haven't really had a purpose for using anything because i don't know why i would disguise who i was flash manufacturing and services data which report earlier than ism uh they don't get the same respect as ism <clears throat> what investment would you have within your resp our RSP in your time frame, if your time frame is 18 years and you won't touch those funds at all, <clears throat> would you hold it passively or try to generate a better return? Well, because it's critical money, I'd probably, I'd probably hold it passively and it would probably be low beta um, with good dividends. <clears throat> and REITs are great for that because the REIT doesn't pay any tax, which means you get the full dividend in your portfolio. Uh, and it's the reinvestment of that dividend over time, the total return, right? Not just the price return, but the total return, meaning not just the dividend yield, but the reinvestment of the dividend yield, the compounding of that over time. <clears throat> That's powerful. What would you recommend for low margin options instead of SPY? Uh, you can go to MES, but MES is a futures contract. That is for 50 uh, shares. The equivalent is 50 shares of SPY. <clears throat> Failing that, uh, you know, I would look for lower price stocks. Uh, I, I don't know that I'd mess around with something that you can't accept. Um... I was asking about using box trades to convert RSP income to capital gains last week's box trades are illegal in Canada. They are, which is why you want two brokers. So if you have interactive brokers and you have a bank, let's say whether it's BMO, Royal Bank, uh, TD, whatever, uh, you, you keep uh, your taxable account here maybe and you have an RSP over here and then you're long over here and you're short over here. There is no compliance department between these two that's going to call you out on it. So you can you can get it done in separate accounts. I asked because I looked into some of CRA's common law precedents on anti-avoidance laws in order to make a successful argument against the CRA that action taken needs to be justifiable as having a primary purpose other than tax avoidance. Uh, using the book. Yeah, <clears throat> well, that's exactly it. That's it, It's illegal. All right. So if you are audited, uh, if, if you do successfully drain your RSP account, uh, don't be surprised if somebody has a question, right? And uh, you're going to have to show another account that has that trade in it. And if that's all you were doing, then yeah, you got a problem. That's why it's illegal. <laughs> so you got to be, you know, when I say it's illegal, it's illegal. There is a way around it if you have two different brokers, but keep in mind, uh, you're not, you know, 
tiptoeing up to the line, you're crossing the line. It is illegal to do. You might be able to get away with it a couple of times by just saying, look, I have my uh, investment strategy in my RSP, my long-term holdings, <clears throat> but in my portfolio, there are times where it makes sense to lower risk by taking a short position. It just so happens I took a short position on something I was long in another account, but what am I going to do? Avoid it altogether, right? And if, and if, if you do uh, one or two of those, you could probably... It could probably be brushed away. It depends on the auditor. The auditor might take a strict interpretation and say, nope, nope, it is what it is. Or it may look at your reasoning and say, okay, I can see that it wasn't intentional. That's not what you were trying to get done. I understand. <clears throat> but just keep in mind, it is illegal in Canada. It's not illegal in the U.S. You can actually do a box trade in the same account. Uh, be long and short the same stock in the same account. That's uh, that's pretty wild then. Uh, <clears throat> how difficult trade intensive would it be to delta hedge a position to a practical degree of accuracy? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. It depends. I, I can't answer that. Um, so many variables. It could be super easy. It could be really challenging. Anywhere between super easy and really challenging is the distribution. Which one is it? I don't know. Give me a, give me a, a time and a stock and I'll tell you if it would have been difficult or hard. <clears throat> With regards to the calculation of GM's price target, you said the market cap and divide by the number of shares. Why should we keep the market cap uh, constant? Isn't the cash balance decreasing uh, the buyback amount and thus the equity position falling by the buyback amount? <clears throat> the equity position would fall because uh, it'd be listed as a treasury stock. So you could make the case that the market value is dropping because the cash is dropping. Uh, but it depends on how you value, uh, on, how, on how the company is valued by the market. If it's valued primarily based on book value, which REITs are uh, tangible book value per share. <clears throat> if you had uh, share buybacks uh, that were done at its book value per share, it should not change its book value per share, but it would lower the market cap of the company by the amount of the buyback. If you have a company <clears throat> that is trading on some multiple of cash flow, uh, and is not being valued based on its book value per share, which means the cash value is not doesn't really have any value in the valuation process. Uh, the share buyback, if if it maintains its same valuation, let's say of uh, three times EBITDA uh, on a valuation, a share buyback is not going to change EBITDA. Your cash balance may change, but that's not going to change EBITDA. So if the market values it at three times EBITDA, that should stay constant. But you're right. The closer a company's share price is to its book value per share, the more likely a share buyback isn't really going to have uh, an effect uh, on the share price uh, because the market cap would just adjust with a decreasing number of shares so that the book value per share would stay constant. So it just it depends on how on how the market prices it. But if you want just a, a quick calculation is just take the market value of, of whatever the company is. Uh, and if they have uh, 1.5 billion shares and you think they're going to 1.3 billion shares, just take the market value divided by the new shares, 1.3 billion, and you'll get the new roughly the new price per share. <clears throat> this is making an assumption that all the shares are bought back at a constant price. It never is, but if you're just looking for a rough calculation of what it would be, and again, it, the company is being priced out on some multiple, some fundamental multiple, and not necessarily its book value. <clears throat> now, theoretically, really, when you think about the market value of a company, you say, well, this company's $50 billion. Uh, but it has net cash of $3 billion, so I'm really only paying $47 billion for it. Net cash means how much cash minus all your debt. So I'm really only paying forty-seven. So really the company's only $47 <clears throat> in, a, in, a, in a rationally efficient way. 
but it's still an EBITDA-producing machine. So it'll still be valued based on its ability to produce that EBITDA. <clears throat> and with fewer shares, its EBITDA per share will increase because none of that affects its EBITDA. So its EBITDA per share will increase. And if it's valued again on a multiple, something like that, then its share price would increase. <clears throat> Uh, good resources for financial modeling within the upstream oil and gas space. Not really. Something that would be similar to what you're putting over the applied level. <clears throat> so financial modeling uh, is about 10 to 20% Excel. Right? Um, Excel's a tool. It's not really my thing. Uh, I know enough to get by, but uh, I'm certainly not a, a world-class expert on Excel. It's about 10 to 20% uh, Excel and I'd say it's about about 20% uh, the engine by the engine I mean um, you have a line item on your income statement uh, and you've identified what the drivers are of that <clears throat> and you've identified the relationship of this line item with another line item so that you can say okay equals uh, F14 times uh, G42 and G42 is where your assumptions that's the engine it's what you put in all the cells. Uh, it's really uh, 70 to 80% assumptions, which has nothing to do with Excel or nothing to do with the engine. It has everything to do with financial analysis, uh, company analysis, and industry analysis. It, it's, it's really about knowing the industry. So <clears throat> to say, uh, are there any uh, good resources for financial modeling in the upstream? What you're asking for is a knowledge about the upstream business because that's really where it all lies uh, is what are the drivers of revenue what are the drivers of costs what are the things the company can control how would you forecast revenues uh, would you use a a forward curve of oil prices where would you get a good forward curve of oil prices <clears throat> uh, does the company hedge if the company hedges you might be able to generate 20 percent let's say it hedges 20 percent you could generate 20 percent by using the futures curve so that's <clears throat> that's 70 to 80 percent well that has nothing to do with modeling that's just that's just a lot of knowledge about the industry that's it the modeling part is is easy peasy this is the easy peasy stuff right this this you can you can learn that anywhere once you once you learn how to do it for one company you can pretty much do it for every single company this is where it changes industry by industry or sub-industry by sub-industry. That's where it changes. That's where all the effort is. All the effort. Uh, the Excel part is... <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's, it, it does require some knowledge on Excel. Excel, again, is a tool, but it's the smallest part. Let's say you were really good at Excel and you were really good at putting all the formulas in and making sure everything balanced, but you knew nothing about oil and gas. You got nothing. You got nothing. But let's say you knew a hell of a lot about this, but you didn't know how to do this. You're doing very good, right? <clears throat> everything is, is in, in that. When you were buying your new truck, when I was going to buy my new truck, didn't you say that the present value of interest payments is bigger than the price of the truck? That's true. So if you pay cash and the price of the vehicle is lower. Correct. The price of the vehicle was lower. <clears throat> Listed for, I believe it was 108. Okay. And then with incentives, it brought it down to 102K. And then with more incentives, because I'm paying cash, it brought it down even more. In the end, it was uh, just a little over 90, 90K that I would have paid for that from 108 down to 90 because <clears throat> uh, the incentives they were offering, uh, I had the Costco, you get the Costco discount, I think it's $1,500 as well. And then if you're paying cash, if you are not requiring any financing by, uh, by GM itself, in other words, you went to the bank and you, you can get a loan from a bank. That's the same as paying cash. You don't need their financing the present value of the difference between what they're charging in interest and what the what they what the bank would charge in interest, the present value of all that is taken out of, of the price of the vehicle. So it's not the present value of the interest, it's the present value of the differential. So if car loans are 10% and GMAC is saying, hey, we're offering 3% financing, that 7% is in the price of the vehicle. You're paying for it. It's just they're, they're going to finance it for you and make it look like you're paying 
<clears throat> and you see the 108 sticker price, you think, well, okay, that's what I'm getting. And then they're going to bring it down to 102 with some discounts for you. But if you offered to pay cash, it would go down even further. You're going to pay for it. <clears throat> it's in the price of the vehicle. There is no free financing or 1% uh, or 2% financing. It's market financing. It's just where the interest expense is. It's either on the loan or in the price of the vehicle. You're paying for it. It's just, <clears throat> it's. I wouldn't say it's a lie. It's an illusion. It's an illusion they don't tell you about. And a lot of people fall victim to that illusion thinking that they're getting a really great interest rate. You're not. <clears throat> Many times, if you're, if you're uh, a good mortgage payer and you got a credit card, you got good credit history, you can go to your bank. Uh, and you can probably negotiate a better interest rate with your bank uh, than what anybody else can get. <clears throat> and you can get a better price on the car and it would be cheaper for you just to go through your bank. I get there's a cost to carry when buying calls when the stock price has to gain by more than the premium and the interest to break even. Correct. Is that the same case in buying puts? <clears throat> uh, the price of the put is lowered when interest rates go up. So when interest rates go up, call prices increase, put prices decrease. So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's sort of a nice thing there. So if you're buying puts, the put price is decreased. But when you're selling puts, yeah, this, the, the, the put price has decreased. <clears throat> when you say the repo account went down, it means less liquidity in markets. No, not necessarily. Uh, uh, but apart from it, what other conclusions can we draw? So you have a money market fund and it has to hold money market securities. Uh, and here is all the money market securities. Well, there may not be any to hold. So the mutual fund has extra money. It wants to place that money. <clears throat> so what it can do is it can just go in and start bidding up the price of these securities to get securities, but that would uh, make the uh, market market money market rates fall the fed over here says we don't want that we don't want that rate falling if we have a target rate of 5.25 to 5.50 we do not want money market rates to be below 5.25 percent so if you got extra money you will draw you will drive the price up and you will drive a one month t-bill to be below 525 that's our lower bound we don't want that so why don't you come to us and we'll give you 5.4 percent Give us your money and we'll give you a security to hold on to as collateral and then we'll buy it back from you uh, uh, at whatever you gave us plus 5.4% over that period of time. Uh, because we don't want you playing in this market because you would breach our lower bound. As money is draining from here, it means there's more and more securities available in the open market. They don't need the Fed for it. There's more and more available such that if they buy it, the, uh, the uh, one month or the three month rate would stay in between their target rate. <clears throat> that's, that's their concern. <clears throat> so when, uh, when they, the Fed is letting their balance sheet run off, that means they're not rebuying those securities. There are more securities that have to be bought up in the open market. There's a greater supply of securities coming in here such that the money market funds don't need the Fed anymore because they're not squeezing out the securities over here. They're not squeezing out supply. Uh, then they can divert some of this money from here to here and maybe they can get 5.45 or maybe 5.5% instead of <clears throat> uh, the floor of 5.4. <clears throat> the Mr. Gerritsen reference. Uh, Mr. Mackey, will there uh, be a financial modeling video for each sector in the future? Uh, the goal is to uh, add it into some uh, some um, securities going forward, or some uh, stocks going forward. <clears throat> once you understand how these things are built, once you understand how they work, it's just enough for me to give you the assumptions. I don't actually have to build the model for you. You should do that yourself. But I do give you the assumptions in all of these. When you look at, uh, at GSL, Global Ship Lease, the new format I've used, I start with uh, revenues. <clears throat> uh, I go to assets. We talk about debt. We talk about all the important things we need to create our assumptions that would then drive uh, how we expect revenue to grow over time how we expect our uh, costs uh, to move over time in relation 
to revenues or maybe our costs are related to the assets and not necessarily related to revenues. <clears throat> I do give you that. I think it's important over time that you begin to model the assumptions yourself and then over time you begin to develop the assumptions yourself. The goal of all education is <clears throat> to ensure that the student at some point no longer needs the teacher. That's success is when none of you need me anymore and you say, oh, this guy, we don't need him, right? <clears throat> Short US, a long pay, so risk is that hot CPI puts pressure on interest rate differential, correct. Also, like you said, will that hot CPI price in a hard landing? <clears throat> well, we didn't get it, so there's not much we can say about it. The market is, eh. <clears throat> it's neither really strong nor really weak. It's like, eh, right now. So I think retail sales is going to be the big thing right now. I think uh, peso appreciation is over for the cycle. Yeah. <clears throat> mm, uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. For your allocation factory trade, what sort of days to export are you looking at selling calls? Um, usually if you're doing an allocation, you're going to do very short. So one week calls. <clears throat> one week calls. Uh, um, but, you know, you can do it on one month. Uh, I haven't really, really, you know, solidified that strategy or that trade strategy yet. So on this, on this underlying, I should say. <clears throat> so, you know. I don't, I don't really have a good answer for you at this point. When you're assessing whether a bid ask spread is too wide to take a position, do you have a specific rule of thumb or criteria? Well, too wide is too wide. I don't know that I have a rule of thumb. <clears throat> if, 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 if the um, price of the option, like, uh, you know, on some higher price stocks, you might have an option that is uh, 16 or 1860 to uh, 19 right it's a 40 cent spread but that's not much considering the value if you have another uh, uh, underlying that you're looking at and it's 60 cents to a dollar that's a pretty wide spread <clears throat> right it's 40 percent of, of of the offer price the spread is 40 percent of that it's 66 percent of the bid whereas 40 cents is not much here so it's not like there's one number you look at. It's, you, you know, you, you just get a feel for it after a while. You just can eyeball something and say, oh, I don't like that spread. I have a question about Costco. Recently signed up for applied level, but cannot wait till September 9th since I have a short position. Ooh, you said Costco PE is high, but one has to consider special dividend. Yes, you do. Do you mean the special dividend would bring down the PE? <clears throat> so uh, what Costco does is it, every couple of years has a special dividend that's pretty significant right so it wouldn't bring down the pe but uh the pe is going to be based on multiple years you have to look at multiple years as opposed to any one year so uh let's say you have your dividend for this year your dividend for this year you'll get a dividend here plus a, uh, uh, plus a special so the yield <clears throat> that you get on Costco is significantly uh, significantly higher than if you just looked at the last trailing dividend. You have to include that special dividend. Um, <clears throat> as far as retailers go, Costco stands head and shoulders above other retailers in sales per square foot uh, and in um, uh, uh, loyalty of customers and in the uh, um, uh, average price per cart per customer, uh, they stand head and shoulders above uh, above everyone else. It is an incredible business model. Uh, and now they're going uh, to start cracking down on card sharing. <clears throat> Here's the, uh, and you know, they won't say it blatantly, but if you have a look at the cities in which they're testing that in, this is really interesting. So you walk in with your card, you show your card, there's a person standing over here that says, okay, off you go. But you're just showing your card that says Costco. And off you go. They don't, at the door, check to make sure you're the one. When you go to the cash to check out and you hand your card over, they scan your card. They don't often check to make sure you're the picture on the card. But if you've ever seen a Costco picture, it's not that great <clears throat> for uh, white people. Uh, it is easy to spot that it's not you. Uh, for um, Chinese people, it's not easy. For Indian people, it's not easy. It's not easy. 
to spot that the card you have is not you on the card because if you do say that's not you you run the risk of well what if you're wrong same for black people it's you know you can make the case it's not easy that that uh, 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 you run the risk of being accused of you know if you say well that's not you or whatever the case you get where I'm going with this without me having to say too many words so they are testing um, ID <clears throat> when you come in to show that you are the owner of that card and they're testing it in certain markets and if you look at where those certain markets are and where those stores are they're in cultural neighborhoods interesting interesting isn't it <clears throat> now if if somebody doesn't have a card but they're using somebody else's card and they can't get in they're gonna spend the 50 bucks to get their own card <clears throat> so it is it is just going to be a money maker for Costco um, Costco does appear to be overvalued. I would just be very careful about shorting it because it doesn't have the characteristics of a short. Uh, it is not suffering on any of its dimensions. Uh, it's not hurting anywhere in its business model. It is head and shoulders above the competition in terms of, of its efficiency <clears throat> and its inventory. It, it may be overvalued, but that, but that on its own is not the condition for a short. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. IBKR Pro versus Light for small portfolio. It seems the transaction costs outweigh the benefits of Pro, considering no margin being. Mm, transaction costs outweigh the benefits of Pro, considering no margin being used in cash and T bill. ET I have no idea what you're saying here. I have no idea what any of that means. <clears throat> Uh, not a clue. Is it possible for me to neutralize Vega on leaps at times of high IV by entering into synthetic long and closing? Why would you want to do that? Like, why would you want to? You mean when when it's you you don't want to suffer when it goes up? Maybe that's what you mean. Times of high but you're saying at times of high IV. I think you mean at times of low IV. Is it possible for me to neutralize Vega on leaps at times of low IV just in case it jumps higher? You don't want to do it at times of high IV. That makes no sense. Is why would you want to neutralize when IV is high? You'd, you'd want to get that high IV. You just don't want to be have it low and then go high. By, unless you're long, in which case you don't mind. By entering into synthetic long, then closing out the, okay you're trying to get fancy don't uh, like I, I i i see what you're trying to do but <clears throat> you you're you're never uh, by trying to get rid of all your risk why not just take a t-bill you know like if you have a position say well i want to get rid of this risk i want to get rid of that just take a t-bill i can't follow this this is you're trying to be too cute you're trying to time the market too much you're trying to be too you're never going to make this work on a consistent basis you may get lucky once or twice but simplicity is is what you're looking for here <clears throat> is just simplicity I, I i'm not i'm not following this you get in the synthetic long then you close a short put but only on a tuesday if you're wearing a red shirt but only if a rooster crows in the morning yeah there's too many there's too many yeah yeah i'm just gonna say no on this one <clears throat> CPE comes in hot. I agree the market will drop. This could be a bad month. All right, we'll become inflated. Okay, well, it didn't happen, so we'll skip that one. CPI, okay, we'll skip that one. PC, okay. <clears throat> well, uh, I guess none of the comment meant anything because CPI came in. Eh, eh. Now I haven't looked at the components of it and I haven't done the second decimal place. Maybe with the second decimal place, it might not look so great, but. The market right now is slightly negative, <clears throat> slightly negative. It was slightly positive. Now it's slightly negative. I think as the day rolls on, everyone's going to say, well, not retail sales, retail sales tomorrow will tell us something. <clears throat> 50K in cash, want to earn more than the interest IBKR provides with better invest in T-bills or money market funds. T-bills, there's no uh, management fee in T-bills. GT has dropped to seven eight range. Few insiders are buying at this price. Any thoughts? Yeah, I, I um, <clears throat> as I said on the live uh, on Sunday night, 
when I revisited the financials because I didn't know what to do with this position. Uh, going through the financials and what their plan was for cost reduction, I see no reason to leave at this price. And I think the market agreed. <clears throat> Let me just uh, slide over here and let's just see where we are. <clears throat> Goodyear tires over $8, 810, 811. Yesterday got almost 850. Uh, <clears throat> I think that I, I, I think it continues on the the sale of the off-road tire business is a done deal it just has to close uh, they're well on track to the cost reductions that they're looking for <clears throat> at this price yeah uh, I would I would add more and I did do let's see if I got it I only got a few of them uh, looking to do 60 strangle short strangles uh, on this two, <laughs> two got filled out of the 60 uh, at I'm trying to get the short strangle at a buck 80 uh, and two two got filled so I'm on my way on that which means I'm I'm part of the short strangle is you're selling a call you're selling a put so I am selling more puts on this one uh, <clears throat> was it CFA dinner in Saskatchewan BlackRock's head of their AI model <clears throat> Uh, well, during COVID, they had to override its decisions because well into 2020, want the Canadian short the market, increasing volume of algo trading. Retail trader can capture even more value playing volatility. <clears throat> I think the retail trader can capture volatility anytime, regardless of what's going on. I don't know that that <clears throat> that your story is a precondition towards doing this. I I think even if you didn't tell me your story. And you just said, can a retail trader capture uh, even more value playing volatility? I would say always, always. Volatility is is a gold mine. Always. Stock has an IV of 16. <clears throat> Means that the price is expected to move roughly 1%, uh, 1 per day. This is 1% expected. Okay, just, just so that everybody can understand <clears throat> what it is you're doing is um, variance uh, scales linearly with time. Uh, volatility uh, scales uh, with the square root, uh, sorry, with the square root of time. So if you were uh, deannualizing an annualized volatility, let's say of 16, you would divide it by the square root of time. Uh, <clears throat> we have 252 trading days a year, which is about 15.89. So 16 over 15.89, we say is about one. That's there's the number of days. That's how you get it to <clears throat> uh, to a one day thing. In case anyone was uh, wondering, is the one percent expected to move during the regular trading period or full 24 hour? Well, well, you can only trade the option from 9:30 to 4 anyway. So <clears throat> what would it matter? Uh, right, it it has to be within the day. So when we say daily closing prices, that is at four o'clock. It's more than a half a six hour day, <clears throat> but you know you 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 can only talk about the day you have, which is nine thirty to four. Favorite few books you've recently come across and read? None. <clears throat> Automatic shelf registration statement, which, if I understand correctly, allows them to do at the money stock sales. Correct. Will they have to file with the SEC when they actually do the sale? No, nope, they have the registration. You know on their next quarterly report. <clears throat> For what it's worth, I did actually try to Google this. I also asked ChatGPT, which answered that they would have to file. But it lies sometimes. Um, I don't recall if I've ever seen a, a filing. Um, I can't remember if I've ever seen a filing. I don't think so because I do have some companies that do have uh, uh, shelf registrations at the money shelf registrations and I don't ever remember receiving a notice from investor relations about that <clears throat> what happened to your short put on HG nothing nothing happened still have it where is the uh, HG right now let's just take a file 40650 I'm good it's at 405 I'm I'm good on that one <clears throat> Vlad Putin a week or so ago released a decree along crypt crypto mining and settlements in cryptocurrencies. I think due to U.S. restrictions, secondary sanctions, Russia has massive oil and gas revenues. How bullish could it be for crypto if Russia would commence to turn over its 
oil and gas revenues in crypto. <clears throat> You know, I don't know. Um, you see, this is this is uh, what I've been saying about this. It's it's the 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 crypto itself is really it it it's not. I don't see it as being enhancing as much as it is about evading. It's for criminals. It's for North Korea. Now it's for Russia. It's 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 for countries that just cannot be part of the system <clears throat> uh, for whatever reason uh, so as far as the rest of the countries of the world go and when you look at this cryptocurrency thing you say look all it's for are criminals and uh, uh, countries that we'd rather sanction do you think they're going to say well let's just let's just let this thing keep going and let's let our citizens uh, help them out or will they say okay we're going to ban this thing altogether i mean uh, if it were me, I, uh, if I were leading Canada, I would think there is no fundamental reason a Canadian needs this. And all it does when they have access to this, the most active part of cryptocurrency, other than trading the crypto, the most active part of actually engaging in crypto transactions has have been for scams. Uh, that's that's the biggest part of, of most crypto transactions other again other than trading for profit the biggest transaction has been for scams why wouldn't i shut that down there's no fundamental reason a canadian need it uh, and it is <clears throat> it is more of a harm than a good i would shut it down so i'm the wrong person to ask on this because i i do think the whole the whole crypto space is for stupid people uh, and for criminals and people who want to who, who just don't want to play nice or who can no longer play nice I I honestly see no fundamental value in this stuff <clears throat> just got the applied series bundle during the discount window uh, or do the work I may start the videos later yeah at your own pace sure expiry to the access no nope, no expiration volatility is high options are more expensive correct so you sell options yep but why would you sell put instead of a call? <clears throat> um, I sell puts because skew usually goes, uh, or implied volatility usually ends up being higher on the put. Uh, and I sell puts on stuff I wouldn't mind owning. I don't want to sell a call because what if you get these V-shaped recoveries that go straight up? The delta will kill you on the call. <clears throat> not interested in the call. Not interested in, I, I, I don't want to sell calls unless I really do think, you know what? This damage that we have right now is so bad uh, that we're going down. Uh, I'll sell calls on individual stocks that I don't think can go much higher, but there's always the risk that they do. So it's <clears throat> it's not one of my uh, top three strategies is to sell a call unless it's in combination with something else. Or we can purchase opt-in financial modeling, modeling section separately. <clears throat> That's an interesting question. I haven't really thought about that. Give me some time to think about that. And on Sunday's market outlook, I'll put, I'll, I'll try to answer that question uh, at, in the introduction. Currently hold COPEX. <clears throat> if I sold calls on COPEX, would I be subject to any? No, no, tax-free, tax-free, tax-free savings account. No, no. No longer have any conviction. <clears throat> well, I do, but again, this is a longer-term play. Much like China was a long-term play, we took a longer-term play. You're saying five, six years, but yeah, I still have conviction. Uh, I don't see that anything they've done would change my mind uh, about anything. It's their, it's theirs to lose. I mean, it is. It, it's their decade. If they can take it away from China, they, they, they should. But if they, if they can't execute on strategy, it's theirs to lose. <clears throat> what books are you reading? Again, what the books? None. Frustrating part is that new positions was not sold as one unit. <clears throat> huh? It was this price if you bought so-and-so. Mm, I'm not following that. I am not a CFA, but use your view in my work. So it was not at the applied level. <clears throat> I think you call it. 
Yes, I'm sure I misunderstood, but the theory up until end of July was combined with people's other purchases. Mm. <clears throat> I'm not following this. Basically, it was if, if you are a an applied level subscriber by the end of July uh, 31st, you were grandfathered in for everything. No matter what I add, you get it. Uh, from August 1st onwards, you get the applied level. Uh, you'll always get the applied level. So the financial modeling that's happening in September, you get it. <clears throat> Anything that I would add to the applied level, you get. But any modules like new positions or if I bring in an analyst that is really good at utilities and follows eight to ten utilities uh, and puts a, a you know a, a short video out each week about what's going on in the utility industry what to look for what you know good trading setups uh, uh, follows the quarterlies that kind of stuff because you're bringing in somebody from outside there's got to be a revenue stream for them at that point, there has to be a recurring model for that. Then you would pick and choose which ones you want. So the those little modules would have a recurring uh, price to it, uh, but you'd still be grant. You'd still have the applied level. You're saying you don't want the applied level. You're not in the applied level, but you want new positions. But you're. I think what you're saying is that. But but that I have new positions tied up. In, in the in the applied level that you must first be a applied level subscriber to get that I think that's what you're saying <clears throat> which is the same as somebody earlier with financial modeling is will there be a separate price for it uh, same answer I never thought of that it's interesting um, give me some time to think about it and <clears throat> on Sunday's market outlook, maybe I'll I'll have an answer for that in the introduction. When you say CPI coming in hot is going to trigger sell off, is that because of stagflation type scenario, or because uh, stocks become well? It just <clears throat> if CPI came in hot, then you can forget about all the rate cuts that the market has priced in, uh, and the higher for longer uh, threatens the soft landing scenario. Oof. <clears throat> what do we got? Doing an MBA, low-tier college from India. Till now, we have been taught financial management, strategic financial management, investment management, we'll be taught derivatives valuation. Okay. How could I be a master in finance? <clears throat> I don't want to do any traditional degree like master's in finance, but open to CFA. And I don't want to be a professor or something like that. Well, CFA is a good start. So how can I be a master in finance, like really knowledgeable? Well, you have to jump in. Much like, how do I get to be a good swimmer? You got to jump in the pool. You got to jump in the pool <clears throat> and have a coach. So the coach will make sure that you don't uh, adopt any bad techniques that, that become hard to change later. So same thing. Get a job uh, and just jump in. To be honest, I don't understand anything you say in Market Outlook except for little things. Please give me a roadblock, like what to do now, then next. And because finance is so vast, I don't know where to start and where to end. <clears throat> well, think about um, writing an essay. It's, it's challenging to write an essay, 5,000 word essay on a particular topic. How I've always started in the past is you have your notes and you think, okay, well, how do I begin? <clears throat> it's hard to begin with the first sentence of the first paragraph. So I begin with a sentence. You, you look at your three main arguments and I just write down one sentence. And then I think, well, I can split that sentence into two. And then there's a sentence before and a sentence after. And then it sort of fills out a paragraph on its own. <clears throat> All you need is a starting point. And the starting point in this industry is anywhere you jump in. Don't try to do it all. Just say, okay, well, you know, pick an asset class, equities, great. Pick a market, India, great. Pick a sector, real estate, great. Get to know everything you can about the publicly traded securities in the Indian market, in the real estate space. What are the companies? And really get to know the sub-industry. Uh, and then you slowly inch out. <clears throat> you go a little bit further and a little bit further, and then you realize, uh, hey, if I understand, if I'm going to be in real estate, uh, and the real estate sector, I better understand interest rates. So then you'll start 
you know, looking at uh, the central bank and what's the central bank going to do? And you start be looking at real estate and then you're going to start be thinking, well, is there a difference between uh, the types of real estate? And then from there, you'll you'll go further wherever wherever it takes you. But the the thing to starting is uh, what is the the the. Uh, uh, statement here the the journey of of, of 10,000 miles begins with a single footstep <clears throat> you 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 jump in just jump in that's what I would recommend how much understanding of economic statistics accounting is needed for mastery and finance oh I, there's no number it's not like well <clears throat> you need to know this much and and now I'll call you a master um, you'll never know it all You'll never know it all. You'll just get to a point where you recognize that you never know it all. So you work, you work with the uncertainty of what you have. Once you recognize that, then you could say that you've mastered the topic. <clears throat> um, it's years. It's years. Do I need a basic level understanding or very advanced level understanding? Very advanced. Um, <clears throat> but look, you, you have two choices. You can either study finance or you can practice finance. So when I talk about the applied level with CFA, if you're buying the CFA plus, on the CFA side, you're going to study finance. On the plus side, which is the applied level, uh, you're going to practice finance, right? <clears throat> Studying will only get you so far. Uh, practicing uh, completes your journey. Practicing without studying yeah, it's a bit challenging. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. Uh, but you combine the two together, practice and study. Uh, and uh, that is, that's what accelerates uh, your progress. <clears throat> so it's two legs, right? So you can, you know, I think you're at that point where you're saying, look, I don't want to keep studying this stuff. Well, then you want to practice this stuff, which means you just jump in. You jump in. <clears throat> um, that's, you know, and if you're pursuing the CFA designation at the same time there's your study part and then uh, you can figure out how you want to practice how can i be a really good investor <clears throat> time experience intuition and a really good trader um, and can someone be a really good trader investor achieve mastery in finance just by reading books newspapers articles nope nope you got to jump in the water it would be like saying can i become an olympic level swimmer just by reading about the physics of buoyancy no. Uh, can I become a very good airline pilot just by uh, reading, reading books about, uh, um, you know, how to fly a plane? No. You'll never become really good at anything by reading. <clears throat> You'll become informed on the topic. Uh, you may, uh, you know, get some insight on mistakes to avoid. Uh, you may understand something better when you begin something so that you understand what it is you're doing. But until you actually do it, uh, no, no. When you get back to Costa Rica, September 20th, your bullishness on utilities implies that spending massive amounts of money to build up new grid infrastructure correlates with strong stock performance. It does. But this is a major expense for the foreseeable future. <clears throat> Why won't it squeeze them? Because uh, they are uh, regulated and uh, how, how it works if you've been through the understanding electric utilities video in the applied level is the regulator says how many how much in assets do you need a return on that's your net income and we'll multiply that by uh, whatever return you need your return on equity that's your net income and then we'll build up all your expenses and then we get to revenue and we'll solve for revenue that is called your revenue requirement <clears throat> and if that's your revenue requirement how many subscribers do you have uh, how many utility customers do you have and that's what they pay. <clears throat> so it is, it is, we start from here. So the higher assets are, the higher net income is. That's, that's just the relationship. <clears throat> that's what it starts from. The regulator says, you will get, you will get this net income. And it is a function of assets. So that's it. Community forum on the website. Our subscribers can discuss trades and post uh, their thesis research. Yeah, I just don't know how to get that done efficiently. <clears throat> there is uh, something called memberships on YouTube, right? And that is, um, <clears throat> it's only for members. So you could have like a really low, <clears throat> a low subscription fee for members. 
uh, something like two bucks a month or something like that, like something really low. And then that the you you can post a, a video there just for members, uh, and then they can leave uh, comments underneath, and then you create a forum under each under each video. But each video would have its own forum. <clears throat> I think you mean something that that is bigger across all of them. We don't. Uh, I don't think the site has that. <clears throat> uh, now that the feds in Canada have declared CPC and rail a non-essential service, they're able to strike for longer. I believe they will strike August 22nd, maybe for two weeks, but who knows. Um, there are also uh, looming uh, strike discussions about some of the ports, uh, seaports in the U.S. Can you discuss what you think the broader implications will be? Uh, I'm not a Canadian analyst at all. I don't know what CP or CN carries. Um but generally, it's a supply constraint. <clears throat> it should uh, um, create supply shortages, which would uh, increase pricing in certain, certain well, whatever it is that they carry, right? Uh, <clears throat> in an industry that consumes a heavy amount of sand distributed on the rail system, each day we are set back about a week in our supply. That, yeah, that's what it will do. With sand shortages, I expect prices to go up. That is what it would do, yep. I imagine this would cause inflation on a more broad scale across the country. Well, it certainly isn't going to help. Um, it, may not, it may not actually have much of an effect, but it's certainly not going to help uh, uh, lower inflation. This could have an effect on September's inflation print. Uh, you know, it really depends on what sand is an input to. And whether <clears throat> whatever it's an input to has pricing power to increase the price to whoever they charge because CPI is the consumer uh, price index. So <clears throat> your business may pay more for sand, but if you're not charging more and it's not, uh, you know, uh, um, cascading down to higher consumer prices, then probably no. <clears throat> I am... I too am long FCX and Z. I expect more pain, but long term, I agree. Love the video format for GSL. Good, good, good. Share your trades you made on last Monday, especially those involving volatility. Again, double questions here. Double questions. Already answered that one. And uh, that takes us to the end of the week. I'll see you Sunday.